Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 2020 Chief Executive Women's Virtual Annual Dinner. Well, not quite dinner. This event is always the highlight of the CEW year and even more special after the 2020 we've all had. It's an important night as we celebrate the leaders of our country and the leaders of our future. My name is Nicole Sheffield. I'm a proud CEW member, director of the CEW board and chair of the annual dinner committee. And I'm absolutely delighted to be your host for the evening. To begin this evening, I'd like to welcome Amelia Cordwell to deliver the acknowledgement of country. Amelia is representing one of our event gold sponsors and CEW thought leadership partner, ANZ. She's a 2020 institutional graduate and ANZ's NADOC project lead. I'd like to undertake the important duty of acknowledging tonight that I am joining you from the lands of the Kamaragal people of the Eora Nation. And I'd like to pay my respects to the elders past and present, as well as acknowledge the traditional lands in which you are all joining us from tonight. I would also like to personally pay my respects to the country in which I was raised, took my first steps and became a young woman on, Nagarago country. The Nagarago are people of the snow and the traditional lands are what's now known as the Snowy Monero and the Upper Murrumbidgee. Tonight, in the spirit of reconciliation and truth-telling and paying heed to the message of NADOC Week this year, I would also like to acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded over the numerous lands now known as Australia and that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Thank you. Thank you, Amelia. That was really special and we're so grateful to have you with us. An amazing young woman and no doubt a future leader. I actually learnt earlier today while we were in the makeup chair, she's currently doing her Masters in International Law, researching ways to decolonise the Australian legal system from an Indigenous perspective. So impressive. So normally I would be feeling the energy in a room of 1200 people. Instead, I'm staring down the barrel of a camera and the only sound I can hear is my own voice. But I'm delighted to say we have more than 4000 guests across the country viewing this. So while it's normally a night of eating and drinking and networking on steroids, and I know we all love to network, we are still very connected. So whether you're at home alone, sharing dinner with friends, in the office, or as I know so many are in boardrooms watching with colleagues, I hope you can feel our energy as together we celebrate this important moment in our history for present and future women leaders. It is really rewarding to realise that instead of isolating us, COVID-19 has actually helped CEW generate its biggest crowd yet. So there is something good in this year of ISO after all. Even today, the Prime Minister announced the comeback from COVID is on. And I tell you what else is always on, all of you extraordinary people who are passionate about supporting diversity in our great country and specifically allowing women to thrive. A very warm welcome to everyone joining us and in particular, our keynote guest speaker, CEW member Shamara Wickramanyaki, the Managing Director and CEO of the Macquarie Group. I read recently, Shamara nominates resilience, optimism and breaking out of boxes as key to her success. So I cannot wait to hear her perspectives and insights later tonight. And to those new to this dinner, you are part of the pinnacle event on Australia's corporate calendar and something we all look forward to each year. It is the heart of our fundraising. It celebrates our advocacy, targeted programs and scholarships. It recognises the tenacity and courage of women in leadership. It honours the vision and respectfully acknowledges the fantastic leadership in this wonderful country and it inspires so many of the next generation of leaders. We want you all to feel as much a part of this special night as possible. So we've created an app to make things personal and interactive. Think of it as applause COVID style. To join in, make sure you've downloaded the Eventcast app, the one with this icon on your mobile device. You can use these QR codes to make downloading the app easier. 
in the app, use the code resilience and then log in with your email address and unique pin sent to you via email or ask for a pin reminder to your email address. With the app, you can ask questions, share photos and make comments during the evening on your mobile or tablet while leaving your computer free to watch the show itself. It's a great way of keeping us connected. So please don't be shy. The more voices, the merrier. Later in the evening, our keynote speaker, Shamara, has agreed to answer some audience questions. So send yours to us or vote for someone else's to be asked. It's a rare opportunity. Don't miss the chance to be a part of it. And of course, don't forget, tell the world what you're doing. Tag us at CEWAUS and our hashtags this evening are hashtag CEWresilience, hashtag CEWevent and hashtag women leaders. And finally, the raffle, our only fundraising activity tonight with some spectacular prizes. There's only a few tickets left, so don't miss out. You'll hear more about it shortly. Okay, back to the main event and a few more formalities. CEW turns 35 this year, and it has had some of Australia's most distinguished and accomplished leaders. We are proud of our heritage and the legacy of CEW's past presidents, including some who are with us this evening. CEW is a member-led organisation. Our workload is spread across the membership, led by our president, Sue Morfitt, and the board of directors, each of whom lead committees of members that give their time to design and guide the programs that we deliver each year. Tonight, we say goodbye and a very big thank you to the current CEW board and president. And I'd like to acknowledge my fellow outgoing CEW board members, the wonderful Jenny Boddington, Lynette Main, Kate Fidgen, Fiona Wardlow and Melanie Willis. It has been such an honour to serve on the board with these ladies. I'd also like to welcome incoming CEW president Sam Austin and newly appointed board directors Dr. Bronwyn Evans, Anita Jacoby, Jackie Conanen, Sally Bruce, Melanie Lang and Pauline Vamos. As well as keeping on time tonight, one of my privileges is to acknowledge and thank the organisations and individuals who share our commitment and provide us with financial support. You will see their names scrolling on screen throughout the evening, but I want to make take a moment and acknowledge each one of these extraordinary sponsor and partner organisations. It's an honour to have you with us and always beside us and the women leaders across this country. Allow me a few minutes to recognise and celebrate the contribution all CEW sponsors make to enabling women leaders. Our gold sponsors, ANZ, BHP, KPMG, NAB, QBE, Salesforce, Telstra. And to our silver sponsors, these are a few to get through, but it's very important we recognise each of them. Allens, AMP, Ashurst, BCG, CBA, CBRE, Dan Murphy's, Deloitte, Egon Zender, EY, Gilbert and Tobin, Harvey Norman, Hydrogen Struggles, IAG, JP Morgan, Lend Lease, Macquarie, Microsoft, Russell Reynolds, Spencer Stewart, Suncorp, and West Farmers. For all of us, Nothing has tested our leadership more than 2020. It has brought unimaginable challenges and disruptions, obstacles, and yes, pain. But it has also taught us so much, reminded us about the importance of hope and optimism and reinforced what truly matters in life. I now want to share a very special video with you. You're gonna hear some raw, brutally honest, and even heartbreaking stories from some incredible leaders about discovering and testing their personal resilience. Resilience, I think, is a hard thing to define. The dictionary meaning is something like to resume your normal shape after being bent over. <laughs> For me, resilience is actually about the ability to adapt to change. Having the capacity to continue on 
over a long period of time, particularly in the face of adversity. The tools and the strengths that you need to connect to to keep moving forward when you're faced with challenges, whether they're small or really significant. To be able to bounce back when misfortune hits. It's having a sense of purpose in life, something you're driving towards. In my experience, when you've been through something that really bends you, you don't actually come back to your previous shape. You come back with, with other things added to who you are. My first few years at school were, were pretty miserable. I was bullied um, quite a lot in those early years. The classic target of bullying, red hair, freckles, glasses, I was just miserable. And I don't know that my mother really knew what she should do about it. But I think what she did was she seeded me with all these stories of perseverance, which are all about, you know, if you just try a little harder, you know, you'll triumph. I recall from quite young age dealing with racism, particularly as one of the few Indigenous children in the school. Going into the, the school grounds and finding graffiti targeting me quite specifically and it just became commonplace really for quite a period of time where on a Sunday afternoon my dad and I would head into the school grounds, take buckets and, and of water and sponges to remove the racist graffiti. I was a history teacher and I learned a lot about resilience reading history at university. Do you see the world belongs to resilient people? Leadership belongs to resilient people. The capacity to, not to be the hero at the front, but the person who stays the long course. There are many times in my political career where I had to draw on my own personal resilience to believe that I could keep going and believe that I could lead people um, through difficult times. Probably no more so than uh, during the terrible floods and cyclones in uh, Queensland in 2011. That was probably the time when I could literally feel myself physically having to call on something deep inside and draw it up and say, you've got to keep doing this because this is the moment that people need leadership more than ever. It's exhausting being in a leadership role, uh, particularly through times of crisis. I think we all at times get the butterflies in the stomach. I think about being appointed to a new role where you know you've got to step into that room, you've got to be the leader, you've got to demonstrate that you're not in charge but you're there and you mean business. We're all going to find ourselves in situations where we need to find that inner strength and focus. You have to have the tenacity and resilience to keep pushing. I think when my husband died four years ago, I was surprised at how I didn't seem to have the resilience that I thought I had. It was a whole new version of myself, but I'm thinking, I'm 76, I should know all this stuff, I should be able to do it. But mostly all I want to do is go and throw myself under the doona for a year. I really didn't find that resilience until I decided to do something which involved someone else, and that was Karen Phelps' campaign. There is a grief that has to be indulged. And once I got through that and started to think of other people, there was no pain barrier. I think uh, in terms of my own resilience being um, tested, uh, it would have to be uh, when my husband was killed in an aircraft accident. I was um, pregnant with what I thought was our first child. <laughs> uh, it, it turned out we were having twins. I had two little people then to worry about, so I had to be resilient. I, I really did have to dig deep. Perhaps a natural uh, instinct would have been to just give up, but you, but you can't. And so then you really dig deep and look for that reserve. And for me, a difficult thing uh, to reach out and ask for help. I think there are many, many, many things 
that add up to resilience. Many of them, I think, are just the personal, emotional experiences we go through as we develop as people. One part of resilience is the determination never to give up hope, to never stop believing that change is possible and that milestones can be achieved and that courage can be found in leadership to enable those things. That was something, wasn't it? Whatever kind of 2020 you've had, there's something in that video for us all about courage, hope and bouncing back. Same, but different. Yes, resilience. As mentioned earlier tonight, it's also about fundraising. The only activity is our raffle, and I'm delighted that so many bought tickets in advance. In fact, there's only a handful left, so buy now to avoid disappointment. Our raffle tickets are the best value in town, I promise you. We have 20 extraordinary prizes to win. So whether you love diamonds or DIY, this is the raffle to be in. First prize is a stunning Tiffany T diamond pendant in 18 karat gold from our generous supporters at Tiffany & Co, valued at $5,450. Also up for grabs is a $5,000 gift voucher from Bunnings and a Prada Matinee Saffiano bag valued at $3,800. I hope I win that. There are a range of ticket prices and you can buy them via the raffle icon in the Event Cast app with the raffle drawn later on in the show. Every dollar from tonight's raffle goes to supporting CEW's scholarships program and helping further our advocacy and thought leadership work. Your generosity is going to great use. So let's hear from one of the scholarship recipients now. I grew up in Canberra. I was very studious. And my mother would always tell stories of me locking myself away in my room. She used to call it my cave when I was studying. And I remember the uh, principal pulling me aside on the last day of school. And she said to me, you kept your light hidden in the bushel at high school. Don't do that when you get out and leave this place here. Moving from Canberra to Sydney at the conclusion of uh, university was a big leap. Starting my first full-time role was a big leap as well. I've been really lucky in my career that I think I've had people continuously along the way who have maybe tapped me on the shoulder and said, hang on a second, you should do this. Then I've sort of sat there and went, okay, I hadn't thought about myself in that light. And those little nudges have just been enough, I think, each time to light the spark that potentially you yourself didn't see at the start. And I realise now, being a leader, how important that is actually to do that for other people. The scholarship has really changed me, not just as a leader, but actually fundamentally as a person. I went away thinking certain things about myself, but I came away knowing myself at a much deeper level and having a real clear vision about where I wanted to head. And most importantly, having the confidence to pursue that. I'd now like to introduce the president of Chief Executive Women, Sue Morford. Sue has been president of CEW since 2018 and tonight is her final event. She has been an incredibly passionate and determined leader and to me she represents everything about resilience and leadership. Welcome Sue. Thank you very much Nicole. Good evening and welcome everyone. Tonight we gather across the country, virtually and in person, to celebrate 35 years of Chief Executive Women. Firstly, thank you to you, Amelia, for your moving acknowledgement to country. As outgoing CEW President and on your behalf, I acknowledge that we meet tonight across the diverse lands and I pay our respects to traditional custodians and elders of these lands. I pay tribute to the strength and inspiring contribution of Aboriginal women leading their communities and acknowledge the significant resilience they have shown in dealing with the enormous challenges their communities face. I also acknowledge dignitaries joining us here this evening. 
I join Nicole in acknowledging and sincerely thanking our generous sponsors and partners for their unwavering support through a most challenging COVID period, and I welcome their guests. I welcome our guest speaker, Shamara Wickramanayake, our extraordinary and resilient CW members, our founding members and past presidents, and our incoming president, Sam Mostyn. As we all know, 2020 has been a year of unique challenges. We have seen amazing leadership and weak leadership. We have witnessed extraordinary work from people on the front lines of both the bushfires and the pandemic. We have witnessed resilience on a mass scale. This year, CEW celebrates 35 strong years as a community of women leaders. We are united, driven and resilient in our shared vision and purpose to make change for all women. We are unashamedly focused on women reaching their potential in any field they choose. In an organisation, as an organisation, we are anchored by a belief that women should have equal seats at the decision making tables across Australia, at all levels of business, government and throughout the community. We need leaders who can see society through the eyes of a woman if we are going to achieve our vision of equal economic and social choices and responsibilities for both women and men. Yet, 35 years on, we still have much to do. We must question why, even though women are as talented and capable as men, there are nowhere near enough women making it to the top of industry. I have to say I was bitterly disappointed with the results of our last CEW census. There was only one woman among the 25 CEOs appointed to the ASX 200 companies last year. There are only 10 female CEOs in these 200 companies and the low, it's the lowest level since our census began four years ago. And of all the key CEO feeder roles, most predominantly line roles, women make up only 12%. In 2019, a staggering 57% of our top 200 companies had no women in executive leadership team roles. And this year, that percentage of companies grew to a shocking 65%. So to be clear, in 2019, 114 companies had no women in executive leadership profit and loss line roles. And this year, that number grew to 129. 15 more companies went back to the bias of the white picket fence days of the 1950s. We have known for many years since Workplace Gender Equity Agency began gathering data that there is a persistent pay gap between women and men. This has been reinforced in today's scorecard released by Wajia, which not only showed that this gap continues, but that the number of companies taking action on this has actually gone backwards this year. It appears our daughters and female peers have no greater opportunity this year than last year or the year before. Why don't we care enough about this to make change? Our voices and our daughters' voices are not being heard or listened to. Their talent is not being recognised. For decades, CEW has worked to convince others of the value of women in leadership, yet we haven't seen nearly enough change. There is a persistent belief that gender equality and women in leadership is a nice to have, not a must have. Well, we know from recent research that women in all levels of leadership makes business sense and that businesses with gender balance perform better and are more profitable. No longer should Australia accept that we, a nation of high intellect, training and education, sit so far down on opportunities for women. So we ask what needs to change? There are three key areas of focus that I think we need to action. First of all, we need to address the massive tax and benefit disincentives for women with young children who work full time. In 1978, 42 years ago, the percentage of women's full time workforce participation was 26%. In 2020, that number has hardly changed 
This year, it is just 30%. And we know that it's full-time or near full-time roles that provide people with the pathway to senior executive positions, promotions, equal superannuation balances, financial security, and ensuring social and safety choices. Affordable childcare is the infrastructure required to release the productivity of women by enabling them to work greater than part-time. The current childcare support policies disadvantage parents from maintaining full-time work. Picking up work on days four and five of the week can actually leave families financially worse off than working part-time. Critics of our proposed policy of greater childcare support label this as welfare. It wasn't welfare during the COVID crisis. It was the key enabler for so many parents to dedicate day after day after day as key frontline workers. Finally, the work of women with caring responsibilities was recognised. Childcare is not welfare. It's a nation building investment. As KPMG and the Grattan Institute, among others, have so authoritatively shown Greater investment in childcare will contribute a massive boost to the GDP. It will provide huge stimulus, in particular to the female dominated industries, which also happen to be the fastest growing sectors of our economy, such as hospitality, health, tourism, social services and education. It will also enable women to rightfully take their place and contribute in male dominated industries. This is an investment our nation needs and cannot afford to delay if we want to harness the full productivity and participation of our talented workforce to build for recovery. CEW has taken affordable childcare to the top tables within the government. Many of our leaders are listening, but too many are dismissive. The economic and social benefits are inescapable. Business leaders understand this, but we are very dependent on governments to act. Second, but no less important, we must make it the norm that fathers take parental leave. Currently in Australia, only 5% of parental leave is taken up by men. In Sweden, almost 100% of men take up parental leave. We must remove the bias that caring for children is only for women and that it is bad for your career. Caring is for all of us and all families for us to share and enjoy. And thirdly, leaders need to remove, sorry, thirdly, leaders need to model flexible and remote working. One positive that has come from the COVID crisis is the universal adoption of adjustable work practices. After years of flexibility being viewed as a pink ghetto, Remote and flexible work has been legitimised. In the space of eight months, so many accepted norms and taboos have been brushed aside. We have learnt we can consult with our doctors remotely. We can run a bank from our spare room at home. We can attend board meetings while our children study in the same room. We can make beds in between staff meetings and we can be more productive with our time by not travelling to interstate or even local meetings. In summary, it is simple. Taking away penalties and disincentives for working full time, having fathers share parental leave and care, and maintaining the positives from COVID, such as flexible and remote working for both men and women, will massively boost women's productivity in the workforce and allow them to reach whatever potential they choose. In conclusion, when I reflected on women, resilience and work, I thought of how many women in Australia are dealing with circumstances more difficult than many of us can imagine. Women who are working full time on minimal wage, raising young children, and often dealing with difficult social issues within their household. The need for them to reach their full potential and the benefit that that would give us as a society is just as important as for those of us who are in the ASX 200. I also reflected that this year, we watched some dreadful examples of behaviour to women, both publicly and in the workplace. 
we have seen top male leaders treating women's voices and opinions as second-rate or irrelevant. We have seen women subjected to sexual harassment at work and male leaders and businesses looking the other way. And we have seen women subjected to public vitriol and criticism that does not meet our ethos of fair praise and fair criticism. The solution is treating women as equals, giving us all a fair go, harnessing the benefit of our skills, investing in the female economy and sharing caring responsibilities. We are on the right side of history and we will win this fight, but only if we harness our power in numbers, unity and resolve. I implore everyone who has joined us this evening to do everything in your power to hasten change towards fairness and equality of opportunity for all women in the workplace. It should be so easy for Australians to fix this, if we want to. Thank you very much. Chief Executive Women came about really starting with 16 women. It was a result of me having published a magazine called Portfolio and I was desperately wanting to read about women who were going into the business world and into the world of professions. In those days, women had to be tremendously resilient. But at the same time, they were gathering an enormous amount of momentum because there was the movement of the women's revolution, if you like. I decided that we would have a get together of women whom we had written about in the magazine and proposed that we should start up our own organisation, which is CEW. CEW remains relevant today because it is a body of women, the largest in Australia, with pure leadership capacity. I am really seriously overwhelmed. I had no idea that 16 women 35 years ago could actually grow to 650 now and have such an enormous impact on our society in business and the professions. Isn't Barbara an inspiration? You can see why CEW is the powerhouse it is today. And Sue, I just want to hug you. I wish I was COVID allowed oh because you have reinforced again the importance of CEW's work and how important campaigning for change and how far we've got to come to move the number of female leaders in executive ranks. Thank, thank you for your passion, thank you for your inspiration. And I know, looking at the app, there are so many comments coming through. I have to share some of them. And I, you'd love to hear this. Megan says, it's exciting to be here for an exciting evening. Congratulations, CEW. Thank you, Sue, for bringing us all together virtually. I mean... I know, Nicole, but it's like, um, we talk about how many people in the room. There are 4,000 people in one room. I mean, it's quite extraordinary, isn't it? I know. It's, it's I fun. Know. It's really good fun. It is good Thank fun. Thank you, everybody. It, it is very good. And we're also, Natasha's saying she's joining with her three-year-old, hoping to influence her early. <laughs> Hope, is it a three-year-old, has she got a three-year-old <laughs> son <laughs> to influence him early too? Yeah, we, we need to, that's right, yeah. exactly. And Helen says, authentic and moving stories, such courage to share these. So thank yeah. you, Sue. No, it's been fantastic, hasn't yeah, it? it? And um, look, thank you to all the members who have shared their stories. It's been, it's been lovely. It has been Thanks wonderful. For, for thank you very much. And thank you. Please keep the digital chatter coming through, everyone. We are, we have a big night ahead, and you being inclusive and getting feedback, it feeds all of us. And uh, we've, the call to arms that you had in your speech, we'll continue that movement tonight. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Nicole. Tonight, we have members everywhere joining in and next we're going to hear from CEW's incoming president, Sam Mostyn, and CEW CEO, Susan Metcalf. Sam is one of Australia's best known corporate leaders and current chair of City Australia's Consumer Bank and a member of the Murbac, Mervac and Transurban Boards. She was the first female AFL commissioner and is a director of the Sydney Swans. Sam chairs the board of Anne Rose and the Foundation for Young Australians. Throughout her career, 
She has spoken up on many issues of diversity, corporate reputation and sustainability. So let's cross to them now where they are hosting a small COVID safe event at the Hyatt Regency in Sydney. Hello and welcome Sam, our new president. And hello, Susan Metcalf, welcome. Hi, Nicole. It's great to be with you. It's Hello, great Nicole. It's wonderful to be joining you. Oh, great. I'm so pleased to have you both. Sam, I'm going to start with you. Incoming president, you just heard Sue's incredible speech. There must be so much going through your mind. Share your thoughts with us. Well, I guess listening to Sue, um, I was reflecting on those earlier um, comments made by some of our wonderful members about their resilience and reflecting on those stories and thinking about the challenge that Sue has thrown out for the past two years about the big issues that we as women and members of CEW must be part of. It tells you a story of great hope and optimism and a sense that um, we have a lot to do. Um, I think there's big shoes to fill for me. Um, I really want to pay my deepest respects to, um, to Sue and all the work she has done. She has put childcare uh, right up there on the agenda. And I'd like to think there are many other big issues that CEW members also care about that we need to be around the tables of leadership and decision making around this country. And I hope to lead that well. I'm particularly, really particularly mindful of those great founders that 35 years ago had the insight and the tenacity to build CEW um, and have continued to lead, I think, the, the, the internal dynamic of why we care and to grow us to 650 members today. So big shoes to fill. I want to thank Sue with, uh, with all my heart and I hope to follow her and live up to the expectations of the members who've supported me to, to be your president. Oh, thank you, Sam. We are so delighted to have you and we are sure that you will fill those shoes and uh, there is certainly a lot of work to do. Susan, you have a very special evening there at the Hyatt Regency and uh, it's important that you've got some members together. I know there's many events happening around the country. Tell us a little bit about what's going on and who is there with you celebrating. Oh, thank you very much, Nicole. We're delighted to be here tonight with some CEW members, some of our board members, sponsors, partners and supporters of CEW here in the room with us tonight and also across Australia. I know in Sydney tonight there are events happening at KPMG, at Ashes, at Salesforce and lots of other places. So it's such a thrill, having got through the pandemic, to be back together and for in those places that we can to be gathering online and here in the room in Sydney. Absolutely. Well, look, thank you, Susan and Sam. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Have a champagne for me. <laughs> um, looking forward to uh, joining you soon and, and hearing all that fabulous feedback. And everyone, remember to give your feedback via our app. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the clock is ticking on tonight's raffle. Be sure not to miss out on your tickets. Unless sold out, raffle sales will cease five minutes prior to the draw, just after 7 p.m. Every dollar from the raffle goes to fund the CEW scholarship program. Your generosity will be helping Australia's up and coming female talent become our leaders of tomorrow. <music> Many people grow up in a, in a country pub, but that's my story. We lived upstairs of the pub, and from the age of 13, I actually worked behind the bar. Rockhampton is made up of a significant Aboriginal population and also South Sea Islander, which is my heritage. I lost my mum um, when I was a teenager. I think she was the one who really embedded into me a um, sense of social justice. I was always taught that it's important to give back to community and make a difference. I work in the field of employment for disadvantaged Aboriginal people around the country, constantly struggling with how to be more creative, how to be innovative, how to find some more solutions to some really, um, what I describe to be some wicked problems in our communities. I'm pretty confident in what I can achieve and what I can do, but there's always that sense of um, self-doubt. Am I the right fit for Harvard or is Harvard going to like me? But like anything, you just go, you know, first in my family to finish high school, first in my family to go on to university, then why can't I be the first in my family to go to Harvard?
Tonight, we have important news out of a very sad set of circumstances to share about a new addition to CEW's scholarship program. It is something very close to Sue Morfitt's heart and she's going to come back and tell us all about it. Late last week, we lost a much loved friend and member of CEW, our one and only Maureen Kerridge. Although in her earlier corporate days, many of us knew her as Maureen Plavzik. Those who knew her, adored her and respected her. We we're in awe of her charm, grace and all round elegance and intelligence. And on top of that, a will to make things happen. Maureen was a highly talented executive, a bold non-executive director and an acknowledged philanthropist across the arts, humanities and social imperatives. Along with her husband, Keith Kerridge, she owned the renowned and recently hatted Argyle Inn in Terelga, New South Wales, and the prize-winning Bannaby Angus Bull Stud. She was indeed a woman of many talents. To me, Maureen was a guiding hand. She introduced me to CW and nominated me as a member. And I had the very great pleasure of having her as a board member during my years on the executives of Pacific Brands. Tonight is about CW scholarships and ensuring our work continues to enable women leaders. I am very pleased to announce the Maureen Kerridge CW Media and Marketing Scholarship that will be endowed by her loving and delightful husband, Keith. This honours Maureen's more than 30 years of leadership in media, marketing and advertising, including being the first and only woman to be the CEO and Executive Director of The Seven Network. It will be inaugurated in 2021, enabling more women leaders to be truly resilient at the forefront of their industry. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. What a beautiful tribute. Yeah, it is wonderful to see Maureen's legacy live on through this scholarship. Um, having worked in media, I know how vital it is to support this industry. And this is going to be very special. Yeah. So thank That's you. Wonderful. Now, speaking of vital women, I'm so excited to introduce our guest performer, Katie Noonan, a true homegrown talent who's challenged convention, broken down barriers and enjoyed enormous success. I think this is going to be very <laughs> special. Over to you, Katie. <laughs> thank you, Nicole. Um, hello, ladies. I'm really thrilled to be here today. Just before I get started, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this country that I live on. Um, I'm coming to you live from Zacharin's Rainbow Room on Gubby Gubby Country on the Sunshine Coast. And I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, when I was asked to do this event uh, for you ladies, for you chief executive women, um, I couldn't think of a song more perfect than Helen Reddy's I Am Woman. Uh, and I guess it's even more pertinent at the moment because she has just left this earth, but her words and her notes are here to continue to inspire us. I am woman. I am woman.
can bend but never break me Cause it only serves to make me more determined to achieve my final goal and I come back even stronger not a novice any longer cause you've deepened the conviction in my soul oh yes I am wise but it's wisdom born of pain yes I pay the price but look at how much I have gained if I have to I can do anything I am strong I am invincible As I spread my loving arms across the land But I'm still an embryo With a long, long way to go Till I make my brother understand Oh yes, I am wise But it's wisdom born of pain Oh yes, I paid the price but look at how much I have gained If I have to I can do anything Cause I am strong I am invincible Cause we are strong We are invincible We are women We are women Thank you, women. You are strong. You are invincible. And have a beautiful, beautiful event. And thank you for having me. Be well. Thank you, Katie. That was just spine tingling. What a, what a gift of a voice you have. It's actually hard to believe, isn't it? When Helen Reddy wrote that song in 1972, women couldn't get a credit card or mortgage in their own name. It was illegal for them to work in the public service if they were married. We have come so far in so many ways, but as Sue rightly reminds us, we still have a long way to go. In many ways, Helen and Maureen were both female pioneers and both so inspiring. So we're almost done. And if you haven't bought your raffle tickets, it's your last chance. Final tickets are on sale for the next few minutes and it's really important that you don't miss out on your chance and do your bit to help Australia's brightest female talent become our leaders of tomorrow. And I know that the app, I've loved all these comments and I have to share some with, so thank you that you've said. Anne says, blessed to share in this opportunity at a time my own resilience is being tested. Inspirational. Well, I'm glad to hear that, Anne. I'm glad that we're inspirational. We also have Caroline saying, I wish I had time to dress up for this. That's a great thing in your bedroom. You don't need to. Congratulations, CEW, for adapting to this new format for your fabulous annual event, Demonstrating Resilience. And the lovely Jen says, what a year. Terrific to be here for a dose of inspiration and that annual kick we all need to keep up the fight. Thank you to all the sponsors for enabling this virtual platform to proceed. Beautiful comments. Speaking of inspiring women, welcome to our guest speaker, Managing Director and CEO of Macquarie Group, Shamara Wickramanyaki. Shamara is a member of Chief Executive Women and known as the woman who made history by becoming the first female CEO of Macquarie Group. She's a passionate advocate for seeing the opportunity in a challenge. Remember, we will be doing a live Q&A at the end of Shamara's keynote, so please submit your questions via the app. Please join me in welcoming our resilience speaker, Shamara Wickramanyaki. 
Great, thanks Nicole and good evening everyone. So this year of all years, it's fitting that resilient leadership has been chosen by CEW as our theme because the global pandemic has been a new kind of challenge which has focused us all on the need to be resilient. And to this end, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the various lands on which we're gathered today and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging to people who have shown resilience on this continent over many centuries. Now on the theme of resilience, while we can't meet in person tonight, it's wonderful that technology has enabled us to meet virtually and greatly extend access to the CW annual event that plays such an important role in supporting and developing our emerging female leaders. Societies and individuals have often had their most transformational periods as they respond to major crises. And I think here about women entering the workforce during World War I or the creation of universal health care in many countries after World War II. Crises give us an imperative to learn, adapt and emerge stronger. And when we draw on reserves of resilience and work together to each bring our diverse skills and expertise to have impact beyond ourselves, then anything is possible. So to me, resilience is about three things. First, it's our ability to quickly accept circumstances and obstacles beyond our control, but identifying which ones are real obstacles and which are just perceived obstacles of our own imagination or attitude. Second, it's about identifying opportunity to respond, finding those open doors, even when you may be staring down an endless corridor of locked ones. And third, it's about acting to change what we can to drive positive outcomes based on our own values. So let's look at how resilient leadership could apply at an individual level from my story, at a business level, looking at Macquarie, and at a community level, for us as an Australian community. Now, when I was three months old, I was sent from England to Sri Lanka as an unaccompanied minor to live with my dear grandparents for a year until my family returned to Sri Lanka. And then at eight, my siblings and I were moved back to England to join my parents who had decided by then that we needed to build a life outside Sri Lanka. And then at 13, we were accepted by Australia as migrants on an assisted passage. In our five years in England, we faced financial hardship. So moved homes a few times, I changed schools three times, changed friends and changed continents. This could have been unsettling for a child, but I looked on it as an opportunity. Possibly from natural resilience, I was able to quickly accept that I could do nothing about our peripatetic circumstances, but I appreciated that I still had choices and things I could control, including my attitude. So being curious and social, I resolved to embrace the frequent change as an opportunity to learn from different cultures and perspectives. I saw the adventure in my nomadic childhood, replanning my future over and over in a new country and sometimes in a new language and gaining life skills as I went. And interestingly, one of my children at age seven, when someone remarked that it was so hard in this country to have dark skin and not look like everyone else, calmly responded by saying, the best reason not to worry about your dark skin is there's nothing you can do about it. So some of this resilient attitude may be in the DNA, but it can also be taught. And in my case, I was blessed with parents who prioritized forging a better life for us taking risks and making sacrifices with the long term as their focus, but adapting in the moment. So through our difficult circumstances, my brother, sister and I were always made to feel loved and secure and allowed to believe we had the opportunity to build any career we wanted, regardless of our gender or ethnicity, our financial situation or the country we were living in at the time. And perhaps I ended up with an inflated idea of my own capacity at that time, because if anyone had told me as a child that I couldn't fulfill my various childhood ambitions to be an international pilot or an astronaut or James Bond due to my gender or ethnicity, I would have dismissed their views as irrational. And this was my form of resilience. 
Now, this attitude of focusing my energy on things I can impact and on the destination has also been a consistent theme of my three decades at Macquarie. As a young advisor, I was asked to lead a complex transaction in Melbourne where I encountered a senior client who didn't have confidence that a very young looking brown skinned female would be able to get the job done in what was an important moment in his company's journey. Now, I could have been demotivated or lost confidence from this, but I was oblivious to his attitude at the time, even though it had been apparent to others. I was instead focused on my responsibility to help deliver the necessary outcome for this client. And after the deal concluded successfully, he took me aside and thanked me for teaching him about irrational prejudice and was happy to have me lead further transactions for his company. So by focusing on a goal where I could add value, I also managed to address some ancillary challenges along the way. Now, as well as Melbourne during my first two decades at Macquarie, I lived and worked in Sydney, Auckland, Wellington, Hong Kong, Kuala Lumpur, London, New York, and Boston. Um, these left field moves may not have made the most sense if I were focused purely on career progression, but by aligning my work with my skill set and values of chasing stimulus from new environments and cultures, that allowed me to create new teams, build new businesses, and to develop myself and it had impact beyond myself and in the process ended up advancing my career. So today I don't see myself as a female CEO with brown skin. I see myself as a CEO who is one of today's custodians of a business built over 50 years plus by 75,000 people cumulatively delivering innovative solutions and strong outcomes. And I'm focused on my bigger responsibility and opportunity to maintain this momentum and help take Macquarie to its next level. So this is probably a good point to turn to resilient leadership at a business level, where decisions and actions have impact across a much broader population and over a much greater time scale. But happily at this level, we're typically working to face obstacles and challenges with a much broader team who bring far more diverse capabilities and perspectives than our own and help us drive stronger outcomes. So in the immediate term, just like for every other business leadership team, 2020 has been a year for us of making unexpected decisions quickly in a new environment, learning and considering how we can adapt and be stronger. And one of the key obstacles businesses have had to face and accept from this pandemic is the necessary lockdown and restricted movement to protect health and lives. And for some, this has made it almost impossible to continue business and so presented serious financial challenges. For Macquarie, we've been fortunate to be in a sector with the ability to carry on our services with as many as 98% of our staff working remotely at the peak. And prior to the pandemic, we would not have imagined our teams would have the resilience to deliver this, but also do it overnight. But they did respond. And at present, about 60% of our employees globally have been approved to return to office on a voluntary basis, but many are continuing to spend some of their time being productive from home. So going forward, we have now learned that we can deliver our services with a far more hybrid set of working options for our staff. And resilience as an organisation means we're using this crisis to learn and adapt for the long term. Now, we also had the benefit of a strong financial position coming into this. But recognising as always that the long term success of our business is dependent on the long term success of our staff, clients, shareholders and communities, we have worked closely with clients and all these stakeholders to drive solutions like working with clients in more challenged sectors and situations by extending relief through payment pauses, hiring workers furloughed in other industries to meet additional demand in our call centres, helping larger corporate clients in Australia raising $12 billion of capital in the first six months of the pandemic and working with our portfolio companies on maintaining essential community services. 
In addition to this, our foundation has allocated over three quarters of an additional $20 million that we allocated this year to help it address longer term impacts of COVID-19, both here in Australia and around the world. These efforts have been focused on direct relief, medical research, and now supporting workers and businesses in restarting economic activity. So these were short term responses to the challenges of this pandemic pandemic, but like many, we're turning our attention now to longer term solutions needed in our areas of expertise as we emerge from this crisis. This could include for us the need for greater digital infrastructure, supporting the physical infrastructure needed to support potentially more de-urbanisation or ongoing solutions to support climate transition. We appreciate that delivering this in a service business like Macquarie, which operates across so many global regions and sectors, is all about people. Attracting great people with varied experience and ensuring a culture that allows them to deliver to their greatest potential in their area of expertise, both individually and as a group. And here, working to ensure diversity of thought and capability is critical. We've seen many times that a diverse team delivers stronger results than any brilliant individual or homogenous team. So we know this is key to our long-term resilience. We need the richest possible combination of different ages, genders, cultural and racial backgrounds, diversity of sexual orientation and socioeconomic backgrounds and experiences, and regardless of any disability. This allows us to challenge each other's perspectives in forming better collective decisions, improve understanding of regional and sectoral nuances, and gives us greater empathy in serving a much broader client and community base. It also makes for a more interesting workplace. But of course, this requires focused effort and taking gender as one very relevant lens for us in the CEW community. At Macquarie, our applicants are typically still only about 35% female. And even though we recruit equal numbers of males and females at starting levels, representation then falls through the mid levels and like the rest of our industry, is down to low double digits by the most senior levels. At entry level, our application rate reflects the still low proportion of females electing to study some relevant subjects for our business. So we're investing time in creating a wider pipeline of female graduates and explaining the appeal of a career in finance to high school students and female students in undergraduate courses and promoting STEM subjects. And this work includes partnerships with education institutions, participative events and internships. My main message to girls out there is why let boys have all this fun? Now, issues behind lower representation as careers progress are complex and still need work, but balancing work and family appears to be one material contributor. So we're focused on the support we can provide as life circumstances change over the course of a career, including flexible working. And 2020 has taught us a different balance between work and personal commitments, including in my own case. So now we have many male colleagues who have taken extended periods of parental leave. This flexibility for men is also providing more choices for women. And we also have an active returner program in all regions for parents coming back to work. Then at the most senior levels across our industry, the very low representation levels are well probably being contributed to, to by a range of factors, but probably including unconscious bias. And I, as I said in relation to my own story, it's a misguided perception that physical characteristics have any relevance to ability to contribute in our industry. However, these perceptions persist and we need to understand the experience that's driving them to help demonstrate that people may be creating imagined roadblocks in this area. Ensuring this diversity is also key in resilient leadership at a community level, where decisions and impacts, decisions have impact well beyond individual businesses and can be felt for generations beyond our own lifetimes. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, humans have responded to past crises, taking the opportunity to come out stronger. 
and writers like Matt Ridley in The Rational Optimist have pointed to the success of our species beyond any other on this planet, coming down to our ability to work as teams, each focusing on our specialist contributions and complementing each other. So as we've seen in responding to this pandemic, some have developed vaccines at a faster rate than ever in human history. Some have focused on healthcare and treatment, others have focused and worked in areas of direct relief or to improve technology to keep people connected in ways that will change how we interact forever. Now, if we want to empower all our citizens to com contribute their full diverse, to their full diverse abilities and keep ensuring we come out stronger from crises to come, then growing Australia's standing as a land of opportunity is key. If we do not create equal pathways for females to deliver their potential in the same way as we do for males, females being half the population, we will not engage and gain value from them, which will lessen our output and growth. And the same applies to creating equality of opportunity for all Australians from all backgrounds. Now, achieving this as with businesses takes considered work and Roadblocks must be identified and solutions developed and delivered to ensure equal access to all for things like education and employment. And this often takes many years. However, it presents an opportunity and an array of opportunities for us to all work on. And our potential to succeed here is evidenced in how all levels of government and the wider community have come together to respond to this pandemic through things like proactive testing and tracing and targeted lockdowns that have protected the health system from undue pressure. And as a result, our infection and mortality rates are significantly lower than most countries. And at the same time, a quick and comprehensive approach to financial support has provided a bridge to the economic rebound that's now emerging. Now, challenges do remain and the economic impacts of 2020 are likely to be felt for some time and economic downturns do exacerbate inequalities of all types. Government finances are inevitably going to be more stretched and we in the private sector will need to step up to support the recovery. But these challenges all present opportunities for us to collectively respond to with new solutions. So I would encourage you all to think about the real obstacles you have to accept in your life, across your business and in our community. And then think about where the open doors are for you and think about which ones you want to focus your energy on moving through based on who you are and your values and priorities and the diverse teams you can work with in doing this. And who knows, you may find you unlocked some closed doors in the process. We've all brought our diverse skills to respond to this pandemic so far, and this should make us optimistic that in the absence of more unexpected developments, 2021 may allow us to come back together for a physical CEW event, or even better, we may be able to use this crisis to learn and adapt and come back stronger with a hybrid format that allows us to continue this evening's approach of including and supporting an even larger group of emerging female leaders. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shamara. So many powerful messages of resilience, of diversity and your own story. I just absolutely love it. Thank you for that. And you know, we have had the, the app, lots of questions coming through live while you were speaking. So I'm very lucky to have this Q&A with you, but I think that the most important thing is we actually go to the questions themselves mm. And I'm delighted to say that the first question actually comes from our founding pre president, Barbara Kale, Fantastic. and she wants to know, what advice would you have for your younger self? Right, well, that, and thank you, Barbara, for that question. It's wonderful to have Barbara, um, you know, still driving our thinking yeah. on this. Um, I mean, look, in terms of what I'd tell my younger yeah. self, you heard in my little story that it's not easy to give my younger self advice <laughs> because I basically lived a no regrets life. That's my approach is that, you know, for me, the past is a sunk cost. 
Um, and its only relevance is to what I can learn for the present and the future, which is yeah. where my focus always is. Having said that, even though I've now become an old self, <laughs> I know there's a lot of young selves out there. And um, I guess what I'd say to them is, um, you know, we're all incredibly different, mm. even though we may be the same gender. Um, we're born programmed differently, just mm. as I mentioned, you know, one of my children yeah. seems to have this natural resilience. and. Um, it's really important to understand who you are and what you're passionate about and what you're good at. And, you know, we've had such an array mm -hmm. of CEW speakers who are females. We've had entrepreneurs in fashion, in placement businesses. We've had quantum physicists. Yeah, you know, yeah. we've had people from retail. We've got me, an investment banker. We saw this evening Elizabeth Gaines speaking from mining. Lisa O'Brien, who is a medical doctor who runs now, you know, the Smith family, one of our biggest community organisations. Mm. So, there's a whole array of things mm. you can be doing. And I'd be saying really to all the young selves out there, you know, find out where your passions and skills are and where you can deliver value to the community. Um, and then, you know, shape your life around that. And, um, and also, I mean, your character is important as well. I, um, one of my early bosses told me that I was a disjointed incrementalist, meaning, <laughs> you know, I think sort of, two years ahead just be on my nose and I jump here and I jump there but eventually head in some direction. I had to live to that sort of character whereas there were others who had very long visions yeah. and structured analytical careers and did equally well. There's so many different stories in terms of yeah. senior people in our business and others. So I think you have to play to your young self, your skills, your passions. And the passion, I really get yeah. that sense from you about passion and yeah, we hear yeah. it time and time again. It doesn't matter if it's a quantum physicist or an entrepreneur, Spot you on. know, this passion that drives. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a wonderful thing, actually. I, I completely, uh, I completely yeah. resonate, actually. Play to your strength. You know, um, we had um, Jo Horgan talking last year yeah. about the incredible stuff she's done with Mecca and sort of saying, quantum physics, that's not really my thing. And I'm thinking the same fashion. I don't get fashion. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's wonderful that we all have different things. There's probably many people out there thinking, how could you do banking? <laughs> I love it. I get yeah. out of bed every morning and this is what I want to do. So. Which is great. It was great. Well, we have another question. This yeah. one is actually um, a quite a serious one. It's about the pandemic and the fact that the pandemic has really hit women hard. And yeah. we've read a lot about that in the press and there's yeah. been a lot of talk about that. I mean, what do you think we need? Oh, you had that great speech from Sue, but I mean, what yeah. do, we, do you think we need to do to ensure that we aren't pushed further behind? I mean, the numbers yeah. in 2020 are worse than 2019. What do we have to do to make that change? Yeah, and you're right. I mean, the enrolments, we had the stats last week of female enrolment in university have dropped so much during this pandemic. I think it's because females had to take principal responsibility for the family caring. And so I think the thing Sue said was spot on, mm. trying to come up with tax um, incentives to mm. um, in invest mm. in the childcare mm. sector to give women options. Mm. So some of the Asian countries with home childcare, women mm. are much more liberated mm. to have choices and have careers. Um, the other thing she talked about is technology has been a big mm. enabler and that's delivering so much flexibility. So um, I mentioned a lot of our staff are electing to work from home and in the office um, in a hybrid way, and we can deliver our services mm. doing that. I um, have spent a whole career missing dinner with the family on mm. weeknights because I get home after eight. I've been able to actually have dinner at home and mm. still do my late night calls virtually. So there's a lot of options. Yeah. And then the third thing Sue talked about is liberating the males in our community. Yeah. Um, so that, you know, if they decide they want balance, and there are males that want more balance to be with their families as they mm. grow up, um, that we should be empowering them as well. You know, I have a husband who's a stay-at-home husband. He, well, he was an investment banker, had a big career. He's perfectly well-adjusted and happy being at home. And I have a son and a daughter, and my son, when he was little, we said to him, what do you want to do when you grow up? And because of the role modelling he had, he was about five, and he said, nothing, I'm going to be a normal person like my daddy. <laughs> and I said, well, what will you do for money? And he said, my wife will work. And um, you know, now he's uh, 18 and has finished school and he's still saying, I want to be a normal person like my <laughs> want daddy. want to be a normal and person. And for him, you know, there are, yeah. uh, we're having, as I mentioned, far more men elect to take extended periods of parental yeah, which leave. Is great. Not just for their kids, but you know, one of my colleagues said, my wife's a doctor, she's been looking after the kids, I want to help her now, have a shot with her career, and I'll look after the kids. Mm. And 
the first time I saw him, he was in the city wheeling his little daughter around the city and there was food all over his clothes, all over her face. Um, six months later, I saw them and they were all clean. He was making all these dishes at home <laughs> and, you know, he'd, he'd nailed it in terms of... <laughs> Um, okay, and was loving it. So um, well, I think that's a really good point, isn't it? We all assume that our careers are linear, and just because we have, you know, we're, we're a parental leave or whatever age they are, we take some time. It doesn't mean we can't re-enter, and we can't, that's you know, it's it, it's a long period of time. Yeah. So male or female, we should try and embrace family life, yeah. work life, and how you go about doing that depending on your spouse. It's just it's different for all of us, yeah. and I think if we have that flexibility. And culturally, we accept it. And obviously, at the Macquarie Group, that's something that you accept. And the company, I think culturally, that makes such a difference sure. to how people and, approach it. And I it. think that's changing. But it's, you know, I think Sue nailed it with her three points yeah. on what we can do to just, you know, in response to this pandemic, learn, adapt and come out stronger is mm. empower women even mm. more, mm. Mm. especially mm. with the technology and the flexible working. Yeah, absolutely. We have another question yeah. and this is a really, um, this is a fantastic question actually. As Australia looks to the future and the different skills that will be needed in the new world of work, yeah. what should women with aspirations to work in STEM yeah. and other non-traditional fields be thinking about? Right. Well, look, I mean, the first thing is it's wonderful if there are women out there that have aspiration to work in STEM, because I mentioned that there are sadly still unconscious mm. biases mm. that these industries are for men. And, um, you know, as I said, I've not seen anything in my work that being a boy makes you better positioned to do yeah. than being a girl. And so I think the first thing is that they should go for it. They should pursue what they love. Um, the second thing I found when I was young that helped me is think about a bigger goal. You know, when mm. you go to work for an organisation, instead of thinking, oh, how can I get promoted? How do I impress people? It's what is this organisation doing for the community? What's the whole point mm. of my business existing? What do my clients need from me? And how can I deliver that? And then if you get on with delivering that, then I think people will notice you mm. and your career will probably advance more. So mm. it's like the classic Kennedy statement of, ask not what your country can do for you, mm. but what you can do for your country. Um, and I certainly found that helped me um, in terms of, you know, when we were working for clients, I really enjoyed trying to understand their industry, what they were trying to get done, what our role was delivering mm. to help them advance mm. and not really thinking, oh, I need to get promoted. Mm. You know, mm. I mm. need to have somebody sit with me and talk about my career. Mm. Um, and I find being a senior person, you also notice those people who get on with it and deliver. So I'd say go for it. I'd say use the networks mm. as well that are there. Make sure you use the support because, um, you know, all these things we talked about at mid-level of balancing family and outside interests at senior levels, potentially unconscious bias. Um, you know, be using the networks that you have to try and be aware mm. of those and address them. But um, I think those are some of the things in terms of... Um, STEM, but I think it's fantastic that, you know, I was a maths geek at school yeah, and, yeah. Um, you know, came from a background where you either did medicine or law. And yeah. so I latched a finance degree into my law, worked as a corporate lawyer for a year, but found I missed working with numbers amongst other things and switched. Yeah. So, so, you know, girls can, girls can do maths. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, 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 you know, I and think the other thing too is so much what you're talking about is what you talked about in your speech about that values alignment. Mm. You know, if we have values alignment and, and, and it's sort of like a generational change, like what is the difference I'm making? It's not just about the next job, but how do yeah. I contribute? And, and STEM has such an important role to play yes. in the world, actually. It does. Um, you know, whether it's health or any infrastructure, I mean, it's just so pivotal. Having women and diverse opinions and thoughts, yeah. yet aligned values, I think just feels right. And it, it really resonates with what you were talking about. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. definitely. Okay, we have more questions. So right. do you have any suggestions for those who don't have the inherited confidence and actually they live in self-doubt? So how do we push boundaries and create right. the resilience if you're yeah. that sort of person? I completely get that. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I was super lucky to be born with is just being impervious, you know. Um, <laughs> crap happens and I just think, oh, well, the world's different today. On I go. And that's not easy for everyone. I completely acknowledge mm. that. 
But I do think those three things I talked about is, you know, if something horrible happens, like losing a loved one or something, I think you need time to sit down and think about, well, what do I just have to live with now? My world is different, but these are the things that are different that I can't change. And as I say, don't be fooled by things you perceive you can't change, um, like someone's prejudices or whatever, but things that are hard and you can't change, you just have to park that and mm. accept it. And I know it's not easy for everyone. And, you know, you can call on friends to help you work through that. Um, you know, whether you're young or old, try and figure out what are the givens you just have to accept and move on from. Then you start thinking about, well, where can I move on? What has this mm. opened up? Because when change mm. happens, as doors close, others open. And um, you need to look for those open doors, as I said, and then as you see them, you'll probably see a variety of open mm. doors and some of them may not suit you to take. Mm. So you need to understand who you are, what are your values, what's important for where you want to move your life from this challenge you've had mm. um, and start thinking about that. And, and the other thing I think is working with others. You know, human beings are just not solitary creatures. Mm. We're part of a community. Um, see what you can do together with others. You can support them. Mm. They can support you. One other little thing I find is, you know, in terms of that ask not what, um, your country can do for you is um, if you find a bigger purpose, like there's always someone worse off. And if you look at that and say, how can I help this person? That also mm. helps you get perspective and lose, um, you know, focus on the pain you're feeling. Mm. Um, like, you know, I do a lot of work helping kids who've come here as refugees on boats, as minors. Mm boats that have sunk, been in detention centres, mm. caught in the middle of fights, had to go into child detention, come here and not access education. Mm. It just gives you perspective. Mm. You know, when I'm sitting here thinking, oh, I've got this problem and this deal didn't happen or we couldn't, and you just get perspective and think, this is a bit of a princess's problem. Mm. You know, mm. so that helps with resilience as well, I think, getting perspective. Don't, don't you find Oh, absolutely. Look, absolutely. And I think the thing is, um, you do have to dig deep and, but if you can have that perspective and also know what are the values that you're driven by, like you said, that greater purpose, I think, I mean, I think the message you actually you made as well about team, you know, you're not in it alone. I think yeah. so many of us, Super. we think that we kind of have to fix the issue or the yeah. problem or, you know, it's my battle. And actually it's not, you know, I mean, this is what yeah. actually CW is all about. It's about us working yeah. as a collective yeah. membership for the betterment of the next generation, you know, and I, I love love that our our motto is see 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 women leaders enabling women leaders yeah. i mean it is about the next generation and to get that change we're going to have to support everybody but you know we're not in it alone i think that's no, i agree and you know a lot of kids that have mental anxiety it's because they're trying to sort things out mm. themselves and just you know they say a problem shared is a problem halved um, and a happiness shares mm. a happiness doubled so i think it just does help to go and find someone you can connect with and say, here I'm, I am worried about this. And they might look at it and say, are you serious? You know, look at it this way. You, you really um, shouldn't have that perspective. Mm. And, um, you know, I've done that a lot for friends, but friends have done that for me as mm. well, that you just get a different perspective. You talked about this younger generation caring mm. so much about community values. Mm. Um, it wakes you up and makes you look mm. at things differently. So yeah, it is fantastic. I'd say, you know, that you've got to work through it and accept that it'll take time if you're having some huge challenge, but your point's very good. Try and share, give yourself time, mm. but figure out what's not movable and, and what you can push on and, you know, climb. Yeah, I know. It's, it's wonderful. Well, I could talk to you for hours. You're amazing. Thank you so much for this wonderful evening. We have to keep the, the evening yes. going because everybody's got to find out whether they won the raffle. And yes, we've got to... I know. That's what they're all <laughs> here do is... for. No, they're here you for and you. I are a <laughs> show. Yeah. But look, thank you yeah. so much. Um, I, really, uh, I really want to, on behalf of all of us at CEW, everyone that's part of this, thank you so much, Shamara. It's been wonderful to have you inspirational you've given us resilience and pride and it's been wonderful thank, thank you. you and i'm really honored to be part of what cw does every especially this important event yeah. of you know supporting and developing our emerging leaders through the scholarship funding and you know i know we at macquarie when people suggested we should not have the event because of covid and we thought look at the technology let's go because there yeah. are females there that have to be funded so uh, we're just delighted to have partnered on doing this. And well, thank you. Thank, thank you. thank you.
I want to take a moment to thank a few of our generous prize donors who've been with us for many years. As I said earlier, Carla Zampatti is one, as is Cafe Sydney and Dan Murphy's. So even though we've had to pivot, there was no hesitation from them in once again supporting us this year. So a huge thank you as always. Now, let's hear from our final scholarship recipient this evening. I grew up in uh, New Delhi. I remember in grade eight writing my essay, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I wrote, what would I do if I become the prime minister? I actually went and did a hotel management course. As I was going through my management development program, I remember speaking to my GM at the time. I said, uh, Peter, I really feel like I want to do an MBA. And he said, go to Australia. And the rest was history. I adore what Harvard stands for. When I looked at that scholarship, I thought, man, I would like to win that. Um, the second thing I was feeling was, gosh, it would be super disappointing if I didn't win. I was super scared and super excited. It just elevates your sort of sense of uh, citizenry in the world. You suddenly are part of the world community, not just the Australian community. I thought, oh my gosh, I'm from Australia, here. It's the kind of moment that changes you for life. Okay, tonight we are joined by CEW members, sponsors, partners and supporters across the country in a truly national event. Hi WA, hi South Australia, Victoria, Canberra and hello Queensland. Thank you for those of you that have opened your borders. Can't wait to see you again, it's been too long. Time to check in now with our very special event that's happening in Brisbane and CEW members. Welcome, and, welcome Tony Ann Dwyer, CEW State Chapter Chair in Queensland. Hi, Tony Ann. Hi, Nicole, how are you? I'm well, I, I hope you're having fun. I'm, you're always having fun in Queensland and I know that you're there with Alison De Groot in the Queensland office and she's the managing partner of EY. Hello, Alison. Hi, Nicole. How are you? And now, I'm gonna start with you, Tony Ann, actually. Tell us what is happening there where you are in Brisbane. Well, we're all quite blown away up here by the event that you've put on for us. It's just fantastic. I'm here with Alison, as you said, and we're in the EY's office. We've got a number of CW members behind us here, and I'm sure you um, will see that we're going to be having a lot of fun. Uh, we've got a number of um, CW members. We've got representatives of some of our sponsors, and we've got EY's staff and some of their guests. Oh, well, it does sound like fun and it's wonderful that you can be there in person to enjoy this. And Alison, thank you so much for hosting in Brisbane. I'm sure that tonight's theme of resilience is one that is so important and we've heard it time and time again. What does it mean for EY in Queensland? Well, thanks for that great question, Nicole. And after hearing Shamira talk about resilience, I only have a couple of minutes, so I'm not sure how I could actually even fill, fill that up. But look, for EOI Queensland, we've been working a lot with our clients around that bounce back um, that Anna Bly talked about earlier, and not just concentrating on the now, but actually concentrating on beyond. And if I can talk about a positive of COVID, that's actually helped us work, out, work that through in many different ways and over many occasions in the last nine months as well. So... Within EY Queensland, we've actually been doing that as well, but also with our clients. And look, for me personally, I think the whole piece around resilience is working on connection. Connection with family, especially early on, um, connection with friends, but also connection with colleagues. And I've been a member now at CEW for the last 12 months, and I have felt very connected to this group. It's an amazing group of, of women, um, you know, super strong, um, resilient themselves, and are so willing to share stories and actually help one another out. So, you know, resilience to me really is all about connection, and for EY Queensland it is as well. Oh, wonderful. Well, thank you, Alison, and thank you, Tony Ann, for joining us. I wished I was up there in Brisbane. At least I can be allowed in now. Finally, the borders have opened, so thank you. Um, but I'm, I'm absolutely delighted. Have a wonderful evening, and I look forward to seeing you very soon in person. So it is now time for the raffle. Thank you once again to all our incredibly generous prize sponsors, and a huge thanks to everybody who purchased tickets, 
I wish you good luck. Our online raffle is about to be drawn live and is being hosted by Raffle Link. Winners will be notified within 72 hours, so arrangements can be made to get you your prize. So let's begin. Prize number 20 is from Vogue, and it's a glamorous 12-month subscription to Vogue VIP, which gives you your monthly magazine, a digital edition, VIP events, invitations, insider content, and exclusive offers, valued at $168. And the winner is 1227 Muscolo, Michelle Muscolo. Um, prize 19 is from Hoyt Cinemas. 10 Hoyt's Lux tickets to use at any Hoyt's Lux across Australia, valued at $420. Drum roll, and the winner is number 256, Katie Bennett Stenton. Prize number 18 is from Dan Murphy's. It's a bottle of Clarendon Hills Australis Sierra 2008, valued at $500. And the winner is number 334, Lyndall Stoyles. Our next two prizes have been generously provided by CEW member Naomi Simpson. Prize number 17 is from Red Balloon. Experience the exhilaration of a sunrise hot air balloon over the Hunter Valley, followed by an a la carte breakfast for two. Peaceful yet exhilarating, I understand. Valued at $750. And the winner is number 1489, Virginia Halili. Prize number 16, all from, also from Red Balloon, is the romance of glamping under the stars with a two-night getaway on the far south coast of New South Wales, which includes breakfast and dinner hampers, lots of local produce, valued at $750. And the winner is number 325, Lisa Robinson. Prize number 15 from Dan Murphy's, a bottle of Penfolds Grange Hermitage 2015 valued at $850 and the winner is number 1070, Marnie Oten. And for this next prize, wouldn't it be a nice treat to finally return to the theatre once again? So prize number 14 is from the Sydney Theatre Company. It includes two tickets to Fun Home Opening All Night in, on Saturday the 1st of May. It includes signed program, post-show party, valued at $1,000. And the winner is number 764, Katrina Rathie. Prize number set 13 is from Mecca with thanks to CEW member and in fact last year's annual dinner speaker, Joe Horgan. This edit of essentials includes luxury body creams, oils, some protection, radiance boosting formulas. It's created to enhance your experience. Mecca's expertly crafted collection and many fragrances valued at $1,250. And the winner is number 418, Robin Denholm. All these wonderful members that are winning, it's wonderful. Prize number 12 from Centre Group. One Westfield $1,000 gift card, three valet parking passes valued at $1,270. And the winner is number 220, Renee Roberts. Prize number 11 is from the Centre Group as well. Westfield, $1,000 gift card, three valet parking, valued at $1,270. And the winner is number 187, Michelle Forrest. And a replica of the previous prize is a huge thanks to Senna. have also supported our raffle the last few years. Prize number 10 is from Hyatt, our lovely host this uh, evening at, in Sydney, which is two nights in the suite room of your choice of your location all around the country, Hyatt Regency Sydney, Park Hyatt Melbourne, Hyatt Regency Perth. It's valued at $1,500 and the winner is uh, 1021 Louise Stroyoff. Prize number nine for one of our generous and long-standing CEW members, Carla Zampatti. And I know that Shamara was wearing a beautiful Carla Zampatti dress. I'm in Bianca Spender. We love Carla and Bianca. Beautiful gift voucher valued at $1,500. And the winner is number 1266, Kathy Hirschfeld. Prize number eight from Red Energy. Two lucky winners have a chance to receive one year of free electricity from Red Energy. Valued at $1,500. Oh, and the winner is number 1352, Jackie Feeney. Prize number seven, also from Red Energy. The second winner is number 139, Susan Buckley. Prize six from the Art Gallery of New South Wales, which is a private tour with one of the gallery's curators, lunch at the gallery restaurant, and one year membership to the gallery's women's group, Fearless, valued at $1,700. And the winner is number 1643, Alison Terry. And prize number five is also from Vogue, a luxury skincare, makeup and fragrant basket, fragrance basket, valued at $2,000. And the winner is 
Number 570, Catherine Greiner. Prize number four is from our wonderful friends at Cafe Sydney who always support this event and really a lunch or dinner for 12 in their private de dining room is such a treat, especially when it's pre prepared by Cafe Sydney's executive chef, James Kidman with its beautiful selected quality wines, valued at $3,000. The winner is number 1256, Penny Berger. Prize number three from the Divine Prada, oh drum roll, the Prada matinee bag in Safiana leather with its shoulder strap is defined by its harmonious silhouette, including a detachable leather handle. And, and I'm not really, I don't know how to do this, a 105 centimetre, centimetre leather shoulder strap valued at 3,800. Oh, wonderful. And the winner is number 2330, oh, it's 2030, Martin Jager is great. Now this is a prize from a place where I think all of Australia has visited multiple times since March. Prize number two is from Bunnings. It's a Bunnings gift voucher valued at $5,000. And the winner is number 1498, Alexandra West. And now for the very big drum roll, the winner of the first prize, the Divine Tiffany T Diamond Pendant in 18 karat gold. A baguette diamond shines at the centre of this bold circular parve diamond pendant, as multifaceted as it is iconic. The Tiffany T collection is a tangible reminder of the connections we feel but we can't see. Layer your collection of Tiffany pendants with its design for a striking statement. <gasps> oh, we're valued at $5,450 and the winner is number 927, a very, very lucky Katie Cooper. Well done. Congratulations to all the winners this evening. Thank you for everyone for your generous support of CEW. My final task is to thank those who've made this event such a success. As you can imagine, taking a 1200 plus guest live event and turning it into a virtual show takes an enormous amount of hard work, patience, creativity, and yes, I've got to say it, resilience. I would like to thank and formally acknowledge the CEW Annual Dinner Committee, the wonderful Sue Cato, Caroline Gurney, Marianne Pavic, Sam Moston, and and Anita Jacoby. I would also like to note the enormous contribution of the incredible Lyndall Fahey from the Fresh Group, who has produced this event for us for 13 years. She's faced, faced many hurdles in that time, but none as great as this year. So well done and many, many thanks to you, Lyndall. Thank you to Susan Metcalf, our incredible CEO, and the incredible CEW head office team. We really appreciate your support and nimbleness and hard work. Now, on a personal note, this is my last annual event as chair and as board director. It's a wonderful way to end. It's a bit sad, but it's a joyful, resilient time. So a huge thank you to all our guests who've joined us tonight in our mission to empower and enable women in leadership. Amazing comments from so many of you. Sienna says, what a wonderful event. I'm a young woman in a position of leadership and this type of community inspires me to strive to make a difference in my career. Well, that is just wonderful. We've also got Megan saying, congratulations, Sam. CEW is sure to thrive under your incredible le leadership. Looking forward to supporting you. And Renee sends some heartwarming, heartwarming, heartwarming words as well. It's been a tough year, but I feel stronger now. Thanks, CEW. This is just what I needed. So to be reminded of all those wonderful women out there because I know I am woman. So I hope that you got as much out of this evening as I did, that all of you are strong, you are wonderful, you are invincible, and we are going to have an amazing 2021. Cheers and good night. <music>